I've looked at an unbelievable amount of new camera releases this year, and Sony has treated us to one of my favourites, the Sony a7S III. However today, we are taking our first look at a camera that I think is actually a little bit more exciting. This is the FX6. We managed to get our hands on the FX6 for a few hours a couple of months back in Sony's office in Pinewood. Fingers crossed we get a longer amount of time to properly test the camera as soon as possible so we can do a full review, so make sure you're subscribed for that. The FS5 originally came out back in 2015 and we then got the Mark II version in 2018 which brought some awesome features to this great little camera. However in 2020 the FS5 has started to show its age. It's a fantastic camera from a usability standpoint but sensor technology has come a long way over the past few years and the market is full of more modern options now. The FX6 takes everything people loved from the FS5 Mark II and turns it up to 11. With the FX6, Sony has also separated the Venice FX9 and FX6 into their new cinema line. However, the FX6 is also now part of the Alpha line, as you can see from this branding, and it's the first step in Sony's plan to produce more video focus orientated products under the Alpha line. Although, I would argue even though the A7S III is in a stills camera body, its primary focus is video. Anyway, let's take a look at what the FX6 is all about. The sensor in the FX6 is similar to the one featured in the A7S III. I say similar because Sony has told us that it is part of the same family, but not exactly the same. The FX6 features a 10.2 megapixel full frame back illuminated sensor combined with dual Bionz XR processors, and this results in 15 plus stops of dynamic range in S-Log3, improved rolling shutter performance, and the same not dual base ISO, but kind of dual base ISO of 800 and 12,800 in S-Log3 as the A7S III. However, one thing that this camera has different over the A7S III is the ability to turn off noise reduction. I would always recommend doing denoising in post, and now that you have the option, the footage out of this camera could not only be more detailed than the A7S III, but also cleaner once denoised in post. Once we get hold of a camera to fully test, we'll do some tests in a follow-up video. The sensor is a perfect fit for this kind of camera. It's great for people controlling the light as well as others reacting to light. This camera will be able to handle a lot of different shooting scenarios really well, and I'm really excited to see what people capture with this camera. The FX6 features the same variable ND filter system that is in the FX9, which will provide you with two to seven stops of ND throughout its range. Even the controls are exactly the same as the FX9, which you can see here. With this cluster of buttons, dials, and switches, you can switch between the physical stops, electronic variable ND or auto ND. This will make operating the camera much faster and means you can use the multifunction dial to control either ISO or light balance or shutter. You can easily switch between the stepped ND or variable using the switch. You can even toggle on auto ND, which will automatically adjust the amount of ND as you're shooting. This can work, but sometimes can look a bit jarring when going from extreme exposure differences in light or if the camera meters something slightly wrong. But still, this will be a very handy feature to have at your fingertips. The FX6, like the FX9, also features a clear filter, which is a small thing, but this means that you will not have any shifts in back focus when changing between ND and clear, which was an issue with previous FS series cameras. The FX features the same level of autofocus that is featured in the FX9 and A7S III, but with some slight updates. It features 627 autofocus points, which is slightly more than the 561 of the FX9 and slightly less than the 759 that the A7S III features. It also features the same face and eye tracking that the FX9 has with the version 2.0 firmware. The autofocus is also available across every recording frame rate, but I'm intrigued to see if this includes face tracking and eye tracking in high frame rate modes, but we'll see this when we get hold of a camera. One difference between the FX6 and the A7S III is that the A7S III features object tracking, whereas the FX6 does not. Hopefully this is something that can be updated via a firmware update. From the very brief time we had with the camera, it was just as impressive as the cameras previously mentioned and should be a great option for scenarios that call for it, especially on a gimbal like the recently released DJI RS2. With the FS5, Sony clearly separated it from the FS7 by its codex. The FS5 was limited to XAVC-L, whereas the FS7 had XAVC-I as well as L. However, this isn't the case with the FX6. The FX6 features the same formats as the FX9, as you can shoot in a range of XAVCI and L formats. One thing to note is that this is proper XAVCI, not XAVCSI from the A7S III, so compression should be better in the FX6, and it will be using the same MXF wrapper that FS shooters will be used to. 
You can shoot in either DCI 4K or UHD in the top XAVCI 4210 bit option, which will give you roughly 300 megabits at 30p. The only Super 35 mode is in 1080p. However, one way around this is to use the clear image zoom option while we're in the full frame modes to get around the coverage of your Super 35 glass. But we'll explore this more in our review. The FX6 is capable of capturing DCI 4K up to 60 frames per second, UHD 4K up to 120 frames per second, and Full HD up to 240 frames per second, with no pixel binning or line skipping. And these are all available using XAVCI Class 300 in 10-bit 422. However, in UHD mode, you have a 10% crop, which isn't too much. This is a pretty incredible set of recording formats and actually beats the FX9 in some areas. If the high frame rate footage out of the FX6 looks even a little bit better than the A7S III, these are going to be a very popular set of formats. One note that we made during our brief time of the FX6 was that the high frame rate formats are consistent in bitrate, unlike the A7S III, which is great to hear. When it comes to recording media, the FX6 uses the same dual SD and CF Express Type A card slots as the A7S III. The mechanism covering the slots is extremely solid. When it comes to what media you need to record a specific format, it's the same as the A7S III. That means you can record a huge portion of the formats to SD cards. However, you will need a CF Express Type A card when shooting in HFR mode upwards of 60p and upwards of 150 frames per second in Full HD. Otherwise, you can pick up a V90 SD card and record every other codec, which is awesome. I could see a lot of people investing into a couple of V90 cards for the primary formats and then a single CF Express card for when 4K All I is required. When it comes to which media we will be recommending, again, it's going to be what we'd have with the A7S III. So for the V90 cards, we suggest picking up the Angelbird AV Pro cards. And for the CF Express Type A, the only option on the market currently is Sony's own brand ones, which are available in 80 and 160 gig variants. The FX6 doesn't feature sensor IBIS, but it does feature the same gyro metadata option and workflow as the FX9. From what we've seen, this could be handy in certain situations, but I do think it would have been great for them to have included some kind of sensor-based stabilization in this kind of camera, but I understand why they haven't. As you'd expect from a camera within Sony's new cinema line, it features the same system and range of color and gamma profiles. This means it features the same S-Log2 and S-Log3 and S-Gamma3 and S-Gamma3 Cine as the FX9 and the Venice. The camera also features the same S-Cinetone profile that Sony introduced in the FX9. Sony has designed S-Cinetone as a quick turnaround acquisition look that takes inspiration from the film color found in the Venice with S709 and provides images with a more cinematic look and tone and color for the video world. Another big feature of the FX6 is its 12G SDI output. This is a backwards compatible output, so you can use it with 1G, 3G, 6G, and 12G compatible devices, which is awesome. It can also output 16-bit RAW, at the camera's base frame rates, which is really cool to see. However, I do think that FX9 owners are going to be a little bit annoyed that a smaller, more affordable camera can do this without a large and expensive attachment on the back of it. This will most likely work with existing Atomos recorders like the Shogun 7, as it works with the FX9, and with Pro's RAW updates that have come out recently, this is a very exciting feature for getting the absolute most out of the camera. I can't wait to test this out when we get a camera in to do a full review. The FX6 features an MI shoe on the top handle, which you can use with Sony's existing UWP series dual channel receiver to achieve four channels of audio with the two XLR ports on the right side of the handle. You can also use it with any other MI shoe accessory on the market at the moment. This was the case with the FX9. However, the FX6 only has hardware controls for two channels instead of the four on the FX9 body. It's great that you have the option to use Sony's awesome ecosystem on this camera. So I know a lot of people are going to be asking, why would anyone buy an FX9 over the FX6 now? Well, there are a few differences. The first being the sensors in the cameras. The FX9 sensor is a higher resolution than the FX6. And this means the FX9's downsampling, which should improve overall image quality and give you closer to true 4K resolution. The FX9 also features cropped Super 35 modes. However, one way to do this with the FX6 would be to use clear image zoom when using lenses that won't cover the full frame sensor. The FX9 also features Genlock and RCP support, has more I.O., can shoot interlaced, and features compatibility with XDCam Air. It's also a larger form factor, which could be seen as a pro or a con, and has more buttons for controlling the camera, and features the ability to control all four channels of audio physically on the camera. It also has a locking E-mount, which again could be seen as a pro or a con. It's a much more secure mount with less play, but it's also much harder to operate as a solo operator than regular E-mount. I do think, however, that these differences will only warrant the fairly substantial price difference for a few people. And for most, the FX6 will be the more logical choice. 
I'm intrigued to see what and if Sony can implement any new systems or firmware to help separate the FX9 from the FX6. Let us know what you think Sony could add to the FX9 in the comments below. Physically, the camera pulls design influence from both the FS5 Mark II and the FX9. It has the same style body as the FX9, is made out of magnesium alloy and has a slightly larger form factor than the FS5 Mark II. At 860 grams, it only weighs 60 grams more than the FS5 Mark II and is quite a bit lighter than the two kilograms of the FX9. Let's take a very quick look around the camera physically and what it's got going on. At the front, you have a regular E-mount. I'm happy to see a regular E-mount here as I feel like this gives people who are solo operating a much easier time changing lenses and if you need the extra security of a locking mount, you can always use a secured locking mount attached to a support. There are a few buttons on the front too, a white balance set, an auto button and a manual focus switch and an autofocus push auto button. Moving on to the top of the camera, which looks very similar to the FS5, apart from a few changes to the design of the top handle. It looks like FS5 top plate should work with the FX6, but we will need to test this to be 100% sure. There are a couple of mounting points with locating pins around it, also for mounting the monitor bracket securely too. The new handle now features a new dial and a joystick. I love the handle that Sony uses on a lot of their cameras already, but these new additions now make it even better. The ability to use these new additions to control the camera while down low or at a different angle is great. This is by far the best top handle shipping with any camera on the market currently when it comes to functionality. There's also the same MI shoe that you expect from previous Sony cameras, which will allow you to use any MI shoe accessory. There are also a few extra quarter inch threads on the top of the handle, which could come in handy for mounting accessories. Attached to the handle, you have a bracket for holding a mic and then the new screen, which has been taken from the FX9. This monitor now has a resolution of 1280 by 720, which is an improvement over the one from the FS5 Mark II. It also features the same touch interface system that Sony has brought to the FX9. This menu system is awesome and makes navigating settings you may need while shooting very fast and easy. It comes with the same hood as the FS5 Mark II as standard. However, if you want to use it with the FX9's loop, you'll be able to pick one up as a spare as Sony will be offering it. This will be handy as we have lost the viewfinder at the back of the FS5 Mark II, which I think makes sense as I didn't see many people using it and for those, it just adds extra cost. On the left of the camera, you have a very similar layout to previous FS or FX series cameras. So if you are coming from one of those, you should feel right at home in no time. Obviously with the smaller body design, some buttons have been removed from the FX9, but that's to be expected. I'm glad however, that the FX6 features the same multifunction dial used on the FX9 as it's great for navigating around the menu system. As well as the familiar buttons we expect on this camera, there is a new flag button. This is basically a rate button that will flag the clip which will be stored in metadata and then carried over into your post-production workflow. You can either hit the flag button during recording or after the fact to apply this tag. I'm intrigued if this will be implemented into existing NLE programs or if this will be limited to just for use with Sony Catalyst Browse. Another difference to the FX9 is the ability to only control two of the possible four channels of audio physically on the camera, whereas the FX9, you can control all four from the body. If you want to control all four of them, then you have to do this in the menu system. On the right, you have the same grip as the FS5, which is great, as the ergonomics of it are fantastic, and so is the functionality. This means extensions and rigging should work from existing FS5 options. You then have the inputs and outputs of the camera. This is a full size HDMI, SDI out, which we mentioned earlier, time code in it or out, but no gen lock, a USB micro remote multi port, and a 90.5 volt input, which is the same as the one found on the FX9. The FX6 uses the same BPU battery as the FS5 Mark II, and from the specs that Sony have provided us, it is a bit more heavy on the power draw than the FS5. At least Sony has used the BPU again here, as it's a great battery type, and people upgrading from FS5 or FS7s should have a set of these already. 2020 has been an insane year for camera releases. Honestly, I can't believe how many amazing new products have come out this year. It really is an incredible time to be a filmmaker. On paper, the FX6 looks to be one of the most exciting cameras of the year. It's compact, lightweight, has the creature comforts that come with a Sony FS or FX camera, and if the image quality of the Sony a7S III is anything to go by, it's going to have solid dynamic range, improved color, and amazing low light performance. It is so incredibly well featured. I'm actually a bit worried about the backlash from the FX9 owners. I'm really excited to get one in our hands and properly put it through its paces. But let us know what you think of the FX6 in the comments below. Make sure to hit subscribe to catch our full review coming soon. And thank you for watching.